Hi everyone, welcome to our program, Writing Ourselves Into Existence, Taiwanese American Voices. Uh, I'm Grace Le Prasad. I'm super happy to be here with my fellow panelists. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how uh, this program came together. So at the start of the pandemic, uh, a friend of mine, the other Grace, Grace Wong Lynch, um, invited a few Taiwanese Americans to watch a virtual screening uh, of a movie called Tiger Tail by Alan Yang. And it's a fictionalized account of his father's life in Taiwan and then later as an immigrant to the US. So this was in 2020. And from that Zoom happy hour, we actually developed a deeper friendship uh, among this group. And all of us are writers, Taiwanese American writers. Um, and we have a lot in common. Not only are we uh, writing, but we also, I think, distinctly are championing Taiwanese uh, American identity that is separate and distinct from the larger Chinese speaking diaspora. And so even though there are lots of writers um, uh, in the US that are helping to expand and diversify American literature, uh, I wanna say that I think there's a particular urgency for Taiwanese American stories right now. So Taiwan is a nation of 23 million people. It's the 20, 20th largest economy in the world. Um, but Taiwan is denied membership in the UN and the World Health Organization because China disputes its sovereignty. And that's kind of the shortest way to say it. Um, even at the Olympics, for example, Taiwan cannot compete under its own name. It's actually called Chinese Taipei, which is humiliating. Um, and it just, um, it's just one of many examples of where Taiwan is not allowed to participate as its full self as a country that is recognized. Um, and so I think there, there's a kind of silencing that's going on um, on the international stage. But I also wanna say that there's a more insidious form of silencing that happens with the Taiwanese language. Um, so a, a tiny bit of history when Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists retreated to Taiwan after losing the Chinese Civil War to the communists. Uh, in 1949, he imposed Mandarin as the official language of Taiwan and it's the dominant language of mainland China. And so what that did was it displaced Taiwanese as the lingua franca of Taiwan. And Taiwanese was banned uh, in public. And the effect of that is that younger generations have been losing their fluency and literacy in Taiwanese. And so there is a more recent movement to revive Taiwanese and assert Taiwanese identity as a kind of resistance to Chinese imperialism and overreach. And I think as Taiwanese Americans in diaspora, we have a role in this. I think our voices and our stories are important to counteract this erasure and preserve the language and heritage that would otherwise be at risk. Um, so I'm gonna introduce each panelist and then they'll read a short selection of their work. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a short discussion. Um, so our first panelist is Yishun Lai. Yishun is the author of two books and a columnist at the Writer Magazine. Her recent publications include Brevity and Electric Lit, and she teaches in the MFA program at Bay Path University. Thank you so much, Grace. This uh, piece was originally published at Babbel.com, which is the online publication of the language learning tool. It's called Say My Name. When I was in middle school, I ran with a group of friends so tight that kids called us the groupies. I didn't really understand what that meant. As an immigrant in Southern California, I wasn't as fast to pick up implications, snark, or idioms. I just knew that we belonged together. At a certain point, we were assigned S.E. Hinton's classic novel, The Outsiders. After that, we saw the movie together, and we were all so taken by the story of Ponyboy and his friends and their never-ending friendship that we thought to take on the nicknames of the boys in the story. Our friendship, we thought, was just like that. I'm not sure how this happened, but the best names were quickly claimed. Tracy was Soda Pop, Candace was Pony Boy, Joe was Two Bit, and us, since Steve wasn't really an option for a girl in the 80s, I ended up as boring, run of the mill Dally. Dally is not really a nickname, is it? It's just a shortening of Dallas, the character's real name. Whatever. It was miles better than watching people try to pronounce my real name, Ishan. More often, though, I was asked if people could call me something else, something easier. So once I'd been dubbed Dally, I often opted for that name. I don't blame people for trying to avoid saying my name. It was only last year, pushing middle age, that I myself finally learned how my name is pronounced in its written Mandarin. 
You see, Taiwanese isn't my native language. Sorry, Mandarin's not my native language. Taiwanese is. And Taiwanese, my name is pronounced Gi Xuan with a hard G. Nothing at all like how it's pronounced in Mandarin, Yi Shen. But if you're me, learning Mandarin isn't just like, oh, I'm picking up a new skill. That's cool. It is flat out learning the language of the country that kept your people down for what was, until a decade ago, the longest ever period of martial law. By now, you're completely confused. Let me explain. In 1949, when the Kuomintang Party left communist China for Taiwan, they quickly decreed that Taiwan's official language would be Mandarin Chinese, with punishments meted out if you were caught speaking Taiwanese. My father remembers the indignity and sudden danger of having to watch what you said outside the house, on the street, in school, lest you be flogged or fined. From then on, Taiwanese's grip on its own people began to vanish. It went from being a recognized lingua franca to being denigrated as something only old people or hicks spoke. It started to be considered a spoken dialect, a designation underscored by the fact that it relies either on Mandarin characters or on varying systems of romanization, cramming non-Western sounds into Western letters to be communicated in written form. When my parents left Taiwan in 19, for the United States in 1978, I was four. Military rule was still in full effect. Taiwan wouldn't shake it until 1987 when I was a teenager. On the freer shores of the United States, where you couldn't be officially persecuted for speaking your native language, my parents kept on reminding my brother and I of our heritage. Once we returned home from elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, and then our respective homes in New York and Washington, D.C., we spoke with our parents in Taiwanese. They never asked us to learn Mandarin for obvious reasons. But Taiwanese is, as I mentioned, primarily a spoken language, a dialect. Not being able to write the characters meant that I had to memorize the hell out of everything. A couple of years ago, desperate for ways of communicating with my aging parents and others of their generation, as well as hankering to strengthen my ties to my homeland, I swallowed my bile and I signed up for Mandarin lessons. I hired a teacher, a Taiwanese national who spoke both Mandarin and Taiwanese, Within weeks of beginning my Mandarin lessons, I was learning new works in Taiwanese with a speed I had never anticipated, and I could pick apart words I never really had understood the roots of before, piece them back together again until I truly understood what those words meant. I could ask my parents how to write a certain new word, and as they wrote it out for me, I could recall them better just by noting which radicals formed them. It sounds like better fluency, doesn't it? But it still tasted like betrayal. I hid my Mandarin lessons from my parents for months, fearing that I had somehow let them down. But one day I took a deep breath, called them on the phone, and asked them if Mandarin, in Mandarin, if they wanted takeout for dinner. My parents expressed the surprise pause. And then they corrected the grammatical error I'd made and answered me in Taiwanese. They were pleased that it turned out that I was learning Mandarin, if only because it meant I'd be better able to navigate in Taiwan, where street signs are still written in Mandarin, and where only 80% of the population, 70% of the population speaks Taiwanese, a direct result of the actions taken so long ago in 1949. Sometimes now, when I'm stretching for words, I'll reach for the Mandarin before I can find the Taiwanese. And when I ask my parents to teach me a new Taiwanese word, it's still painful to know that they have to write it in Mandarin before they pronounce it for me in Taiwanese. Learning Mandarin has proven to be the right decision in all the usual ways you'd expect. When I go to a restaurant or the Asian grocery store, I can try to pick out the right dishes rather than pointing and ordering in English. I started communicating with my aunts and uncles and cousins in Taiwan using LINE, their preferred social messaging app in Mandarin, which keeps us more closely connected. And I can finally, finally parse the exact details of my name, reconcile the fact that it gave me so much trouble as an American kid with what my grandfather intended for me when he gave it to me. My name is Ishan. The first character, E, is taken from the word for most admired favorite. The second character, Shun, is taken from the word for upstanding. When paired with the second character of my brother's name, Chen, the two make the word for most morally upstanding. My parents, who are so proudly Taiwanese, have some colonial lag. Growing up, I was always expected to be the good Taiwanese daughter, delicate and demure. What they got instead is five foot seven with a booming voice and big shoulders, miles away from what they thought of as someone to be admired or a favorite. I didn't take on a career they could explain to their friends either, so I couldn't exactly be upstanding. I knew I was a failure to them, and my 20s and 30s were a misery for it. But when I started learning Mandarin, I could begin to truly understand the depth of their aspirations for me and for our relationship. Embedded in my name is the character that denotes the Confucian system of hierarchy, the part where a parent will always stand above a child in every single way. If I had never taken the steps to learn the language of the country that continues to oppress my people, I would have never learned exactly what they hoped for. And perhaps most important, 
I'd have never gained the power to define exactly what I wanted those characters to mean for myself. I asked my dad recently about how he feels about the written Mandarin language being the traditional way to learn Taiwanese. He said, it's always been that way. It's as Taiwanese to me as Taiwanese itself. I don't feel that way. I can't shake the history, the image of my aunts and uncles getting flogged and humiliated and sent home for speaking their native language, the very real present day military threats. But learning Mandarin has given me another chance at being Taiwanese, another way to get to know my parents. And I can't quite shake that either. Thank you. Thank you, Ishan. I think you should add most admired favorite to your bio. Um, and so, by the way, I am reading short bios so that we have more time for our readings and you can read our full bios on the website. Our next panelist is Grace Huang Lynch. Grace is a journalist and essayist whose work has been published by Tin House, Catapult, NPR, and two anthologies, and she is writing a memoir. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'd like to read an excerpt from my memoir, In Progress. Um, this passage takes place during an extended trip to Taiwan with my father and my two sons who were in elementary school at the time. And the idea was that I wanted to experience what it was like to live in Taiwan because I hadn't lived in, uh, I'd grown up in America, lived in America my whole life. So for me, that meant mainly eating a lot of Taiwanese food, and one of the things I really wanted to try was Din Tai Fung, which didn't have a restaurant in um, near where I lived at the time. But as you will find out in this passage, my father had other ideas. In the evenings, my father went back to Lai Ma's flat and the boys and I sat in our hotel room. I replied to emails on my laptop. They did homework and watched Adventure Time cartoons dubbed in Mandarin while eating chili crab flavored potato chips. Every morning, my father checked the weather forecast, hoping for a clear day for us to walk from the Longshan Temple Metro Station to an old neighborhood in the Banga District. Every day, I asked my father if we could eat at Din Tai Fung. Every day, he grumbled some excuse. Only tourists go there, he muttered. It was overrated and overpriced, in his opinion. More importantly, my father didn't consider Din Tai Fung to be a truly Taiwanese restaurant. You need to see the real Taipei, he insisted, the way it used to be. There is a kind of newness to Taiwan, the kind that is lit with neon lights and set to an endless loop of auto-tuned pop music. It tastes like boba tea and coffin bread, and at the end of the day, it peels off its false eyelashes and farts on a couch next to a ma and watches soap operas. My father hated this kind of Taiwanese-ness, and I was offended at the insinuation that this was the experience that I was seeking. The skies were forecasted to remain dark during our entire time in Taiwan. If we wanted to visit this old neighborhood, we would have to do it in the rain. Again, we boarded the same subway to Longshan Temple and walked up the stairs into the downpour. This time, my father hailed a cab. We're going to Bopi Liao, he instructed the driver. Most tourists might know this as Bopi Liao Jie, but my dad only uses the Taiwanese name, Bopi Liao, the street where the bark is stripped off of trees. Hundreds of years ago, this was the site of mills that processed timber into wood for constructing the city's earliest buildings. As we stepped out of the cab, I could see why my father was so fond of this neighborhood. Not only was it near his childhood home, but it was architecturally beautiful. The red brick buildings were constructed during the Japanese colonial era. Most of the first story businesses were set back from the street, the upper levels of the buildings forming a covered walkway shielding us from the downpour. Brick archways supported the overhang every 10 feet or so, creating a tunnel-like effect. Some of the shops had wood pane sliding doors. Every once in a while, I'd look up to see a painted majolica tile on a gable or transom, fingerprints of European traders. Jars of desiccated roots and seeds lined the shelves of apothecaries. Other stores sold dried shiitake mushrooms and jujubes out of bins lined up on the sidewalk, just like in the early 1900s. Our first stop was a historical museum with rooms set up to look like a kitchen or a living room from an early 20th century Taiwanese home. My heart leapt seeing the red floral tablecloth and the turquoise metal fan slightly rusted at the edges. These artifacts predate my lifetime, but something inside me tingled with the recognition of an ancestral home. The courtyard was filled with toys for children to touch and try, a tin pinball machine, wooden stilts, a hoop, and a stick. My dad beamed while his grandsons tried to balance themselves on planks of wood. 
For my father, this Taiwan disappeared when Chiang Kai-shek's forces arrived on the island. At the end of World War II, Japan ceded that island to China, but China was in the midst of its own civil war with the Kuomintang losing to the communists. Mainland merchants began fleeing to the island. As defeat became imminent, Chiang and his top brass fled to Taiwan, a jungle hideaway for the resistance until they could stage a comeback on the mainland. The streets of Taipei, including my father's beloved manga district, were suddenly filled with uniformed soldiers speaking an unintelligible dialect. While we were in the neighborhood, my father showed us his elementary school, a tiled two-story building surrounded by a metal fence. As a young boy, he started school with Japanese-speaking teachers who were soon replaced by ones who spoke Guoyi, the language of the nation. In those days, my father was known as Hiro. He is the eldest son and the only one of his siblings to have a Japanese name. His new classmates brought unfamiliar smelling lunches. When they opened their metal can canisters, I imagined that he gagged at the musky odor of beef and the tang of fermented tofu. Hiro took a deep breath of his biandong, holding in the aroma of the min minced pork and short-grained white rice. Lobabang Johoja, he whispered to a classmate in their home dialect, prompting the teacher to slap his hands with a ruler. Ooh, Hiro's in trouble now, a classmate snickered. And stop calling yourself Hiro, the teacher added. Don't you know your Chinese? And I'll stop there. Thank you, Grace. What an amazing scene. And I'm smelling that food as you read about it. Um, our next panelist is Lisa Chu. Lisa is a writer whose work has appeared in McSweeney's, People Magazine, and two anthologies. And she is currently working on a memoir called Hungry Ghost. Thanks, Grace. I'm going to read a piece called, first, um, Can Understand, Cannot Speak. Before Cleveland had Asia Town, we had Chinatown. Although in the 70s, it was less like a town and more like a corner. Over the years, more Asian restaurants and grocery stores started to open in Cleveland. In the 80s, my mom started working at Hunan Gourmet, a Taiwanese-owned restaurant located inside a hotel on Euclid and East 36th. English was a second language for nearly everyone working at the restaurant, from the owners to the dishwashers, including the waitstaff and my mom. In the summer between 10th and 11th grade, my mom enlisted me to bus tables at the restaurant while she greeted customers, answered the phone for takeout orders and reservations, and helped manage banquets and large events. At home, I was accustomed to her always bustling about, whether she was keeping me and my sister in line or coordinating activities with her friends. Mom had a loud voice, a quick temper, strong opinions, and no tolerance for idleness. I tried to shush her in public once. I didn't try that again. At work, mom was extra bossy, buzzing about making sure everyone was on task. She introduced me to everyone and a dishwasher smiled, not bothering to correct her when she told me his name was Amigo. The chef spoke to me in Taiwanese, asking if I could speak Taiwanese too. I hesitated, too shy to answer him. My mom jumped in, responding on my behalf in direct and efficient Taiwanese. Can understand, cannot speak. He laughed and showed me how to cut lemon slices quickly with a sharp knife in staccato bursts. He motioned for me to try and laughed again when I sliced the lemon slowly and in uneven chunks. Every weekday morning, I tagged along with my mom to work at the restaurant. It was a different world for me, a darkly lit, carpeted world of tables, booths, and bizarrely gazebos. Around 10 a.m., I helped with side work, folding cloth napkins and filling clear plastic pitchers with ice and water. If we were expecting a large party or special event, I would help prepare the banquet room, moving tables and chairs and laying out freshly laundered tablecloths. Then I would hang around the coat check area by the aquarium in front of the hostess booth where my mom was stationed until customers began to arrive. As each party was seated, I quietly approached their table and filled their glasses with ice water, accommodating requests. No ice. Can I have some lemon slices? Leave the pitcher on the table. I stood in the back of the room and refilled glasses if they were half empty. 
I refilled and replaced empty stainless steel teapots. After the customers left, I cleared the tables, placing plates, bowls, glasses, and teacups in black plastic tubs to take back to the dishwashing station. I swept up food, usually rice, that had fallen to the floor. Even though I was meek, inexperienced, and slow, the restaurant employees treated me kindly. After the lunch rush was over each day, we would enjoy the meals the chef prepared just for the staff, dishes that were not on the menu. I saw how hard everyone worked on their feet every day for long hours. One day, a group of boisterous businessmen sat down for lunch. As I approached their table, one of them held up his glass and pointed to it. Wah, wah, he said. Can I have some wah, wah? His colleagues laughed. I speak English, I answered, probably better than you do. My mom overheard and yanked me away. She apologized to the customers, speaking to them softly with her heavy Taiwanese accent. Out of earshot, I complained to my mom about their rudeness and condescension. There was more I wanted to say to the men. They didn't know who they were talking to. They assumed the broken English they heard from my mom and other restaurant staff was a sign of weakness and they needed to be told otherwise. My mom said she understood, but that I could not speak to them. Language would be my weapon, I decided then, and I would sharpen it. Um, that's all I'm going to read for today. All right, thank you, Lisa. And I related to that so much. Um, I've also grown up hearing that phrase throughout my life, uh, can understand but cannot speak. So that resonates so much. Uh, I'm gonna read a short piece um, that is called Unfinished Translation. It's from a lovely lit mag called Cora, edited by Lee Hopkins. And I would say it's about language, time travel, and asymmetry. The border between one year and the next slowly unfurls. The first day of the new year wrapping its arms around the globe with Tonga celebrating first and then moving westward across all the continents, reaching American Samoa last. A crooked seam bisects the Pacific Ocean, separating today from tomorrow. Long ago, I accepted the fragmentation of time zones and the strangeness of a phone call in which Tuesday can talk to Wednesday. Living in a different country from my parents, the time difference was just another border we always crossed without a second thought. My dad and I were both born in January, 34 years apart. According to Western astrology, my dad and I are Capricorns. You can count on us just like you can count on New Year's Day always being on January 1st. But if you look at the lunar calendar, Lunar New Year is more fluid. It skips around between late January and late February. In the lunar calendar, our birthdays are at the end of the year, not the beginning. I'm fascinated by the mismatch of these two systems. The fact that we can occupy two temporal spaces simultaneously, existing in a liminal zone that is transitional and transnational, belonging to both and neither. I asked a friend if there's a name for someone who is born during the overlap of the Western and lunar year. She said that we would be considered the tail of our Chinese zodiac sign. Think of a year as an animal that stretches across 12 months. In the Gregorian calendar, January is the head and December is the tail. In the lunar calendar, February is the head and January is the tail. My dad was born in year of the pig, but January would be considered the tail of year of the dog. I was born in the year of the rooster but January is the tale of the year of the monkey. I wonder if there's a mythological creature that combines these attributes, but the closest I can find is a chilin, an auspicious horned beast with the features of a dragon, ox, and lion. A more fitting metaphor perhaps would be the Ouroboros, an ancient symbol of a snake curled into a loop, eating its own tail, the two ends joined in a continuous cycle of beginning and ending of duality dissolving into unity. Symbols fill the space where language fails. As the daughter of a translator and a child of diaspora, I'm often at a loss for words, stumbling over the edges and gaps where we switch from one system to another, where we lack a perfect equivalent or translation. 
How do I explain that living in two cultures is both abundance and loss at the same time? How do I describe the things I miss from another place and time when I don't have words for them? I wish I could consult my dad on this, but he passed away five years ago. I don't know how to write across this divide, how to navigate all that he knows that I'll never know, but I can tell you about who he was. My dad was a middle child in a large family, the third of six sons, the fifth of 10 children of a Presbyterian minister and missionary who traveled for months at a time, spreading the gospel to the indigenous tribes of Taiwan. He grew up wearing hand-me-downs and jostling for an extra bite of rice at a crowded dinner table. Once he told me, my grandpa bought a brick of peanut brittle that he intended to cut into pieces and sell for a profit at the market the next day. The children, unaccustomed to the luxury of sweets, but fearful of their dad's wrath, snuck into the kitchen and took turns licking the peanut brittle, thinking he wouldn't notice as the block became sticky and lost its shape. My dad was fluent in three languages by the time he went to high school. His mother tongue was Taiwanese, mainly spoken in private with family members at home. Between 1895 and 1945, Taiwan was a colony of Japan. So my dad's second language was Japanese. His education until World War II ended was in Japanese and he and his siblings called each other by their Japanese nicknames from childhood until well into their old age. His third language was Mandarin, which became the official language after Japan surrendered in World War II and the Republic of China, China took control of Taiwan. Taiwanese was banned under Chiang Kai-shek in an effort to increase identification with the mainland and it remained underground for nearly four decades under martial law. It was not until my dad was in college in the late 1950s that he began to seriously study English. His Christian faith and ability to master the fourth and most difficult language distinguished him from his peers and set him on a trajectory that led to graduate school in the United States and a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary he would go on to become an expert in Bible translation. My dad mastered four languages before I was even born. He navigated far beyond what he could have imagined as the poor son of an itinerant minister in colonial era Taiwan, traveling the world to supervise translation projects that took him from Canadian tribal reservations to the islands of Micronesia and everywhere in between. I wonder if he knew that the great distances he traveled and the struggles he overcame would one day make it harder for his daughter to find her way back. I once interviewed my dad about his Bible translation work. He said that interpretation was the first step, referring back to and explaining the meaning of the original text, and translation was the second step, explaining into the target language. What language is the interpretation done in? I asked him. He said that it would normally be in the target language, but sometimes a third language is needed, such as English or Chinese, when the translator doesn't know Greek or Hebrew. Then the interpretation is translated from the third language into the target language. Many of the projects my dad oversaw were translations into indigenous languages in China and Taiwan and he was often the final editor, checking the drafts against the original Hebrew or Greek, a circular process ending where it began. In 1960, when my dad boarded an airplane for the first time, it took 27 hours to fly from Taipei to New York with refueling stops in Oakland and Hawaii. Today, I can make that same trip nonstop in half the time. Although the miles are the same, no matter which direction I fly, the psychic distance is greater when I travel to Taiwan. I lose a day in transit and feel like I can never catch up. The flight duration is identical, but the experience is asymmetrical. My body sags with an unnamed ache when going towards a place where my dad no longer waits for me, where I am still learning to speak for myself. I tell myself the journey will get easier. If time and words are not fixed in stone, Maybe there is a version of my life where I am not too late, a translation that will make me whole. Maybe the language where I live is not the end point, but an interval, a rest stop on the way home. Thank you.
so now I'd like to open the discussion um, and thank my fellow panelists for these amazing readings. Um, so to start, I want to ask, how does Taiwanese identity show up in your writing? For me, um, it's I find it absolutely inextricable from the rest of who I am. Um, I think our origins end up working their ways into our work, no matter what we try to do to assimilate, right? To use some charged words, right? Um, the topics that I choose to to, to write about, uh, the way I in which I express myself, uh, the way that I approach storytelling, all of these things are Taiwanese. Right, or maybe it's more accurate to say that they're not quite 100% Western or American, whatever that means. Um, so for me, it's 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 impossible to to separate the two entirely. I'll I'll say that in my memoir pieces, uh, my Taiwanese identity um, is pretty central. Um, I grew up in an immigrant family in Canada and the United States. So North America um, in the 70s and 80s. So uh, in Cleveland back then there weren't many Asians. And so our family really clung to a lot of aspects of Taiwanese culture, um, language, food and music. So I really clung to that and I write about it. Same, I would echo what um, Ishan and Lisa have said. I think that the process of writing memoir is so reflective and you know, I don't think I set out to write about being Taiwanese American, but as I got further and further into the project, it became more important that there was this particular aspect of my point of view that I had to excavate. And um, I really felt like I had to dig into that because there were questions, not questions, but just things that in order to talk about the events of my life, it really had to be explained with the, you know, overt lens of being Taiwanese because it's so, it has been so, um, it's touched like every aspect of my life, you know, from what I eat to how I parent to my relationships with my family members and my relationship to the bigger world. So, you know, so I just feel myself having to kind of like reach back to that um, frequently, you know. I think that's actually, it's interesting that that here we're talking mostly about uh, writing memoir or nonfiction. Uh, I also write fiction. Um, mm -hmm. A number of us here have dabbled in in humor or in other forms, in poetry, in exposition. Grace LP, I know that you've written some, you know, museum exhibits, for instance, right, or, or essays to accompany them. Um, and I, I I think that these these things don't just show up in nonfiction memoir writing, right? They show up again in, in the way that we tell stories. Um, my my father's way of storytelling is incredibly circular. You know, I mean, it starts like way back, it, literally five thousand years ago in China, when I asked him to tell me his autobiography one year. That's that's not what we would consider in Western world as being you know as being an autobiography, right? Like nobody would say. 2000 years ago when Native Americans still roamed America, right? When, when they're writing their own autobiography, right? So it, it's even the methodology of storytelling, I think encompasses uh, how we are as, as Taiwanese people. Grace, what about you? Grace LP, what about you? Um, I would say like, I write about it definitely in my memoir, um, but it's not always foregrounded, you know? So I think it's like, I can, I can write a bunch of stuff and think, oh, I don't have to talk about being Taiwanese. You know, and plus I, I also have these other things going on. I have these other identities that I think also come up in my work of being a third culture kid. So having lived in a different country um, and, and grown up there and also just as an immigrant living in diaspora away from my family, you know, so I think that is kind of distinct. But, but where I always keep coming back to it um, is that um, being Taiwanese is just, it, it has to come up because it's, uh, intertwined with the history of Taiwan and my family. Um, and this is like what I call my origin story, which is that my parents left Taiwan when I was two years old. So I was a toddler. They moved back to the States and, and I immigrated to the States because they had gone to graduate school there. And the reason they, they left at that particular time is because they were connected through uh, an American couple that were also professors at the seminary. 
they were connected to a political dissident. So essentially a Taiwanese revolutionary um, who was anti Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek and very critical of the regime. And the fact that they had this connection made it very politically tense and difficult for them. And so they left because of fear. Um, and so uh, this dissident actually went on to escape Taiwan, escape house arrest, was granted asylum in Sweden and ultimately the United States. Um, and so, um, but, but it was toxic to, to know him. Like it was actually very frightening for my parents. They were afraid of being blacklisted. Chiang Kai-shek has violently persecuted his enemies. And so, so that was how they ended up in the States. And that is really the, the, the basis of my whole identity and who I am. You know, like everything about what I write and who I am goes back to that event in time because I was separated at a young age from the rest of my family and my culture and grew up speaking English. There's a real sense of fear too, right? We talk about um, it being politi politically difficult for your family or for our families who may have been involved in, in those type of efforts. But the reality is that it was a life-threatening time to be separate, you know, to be against the KMT, right, or to be anti Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and I think people forget that, you know, we don't talk about political refugees from Taiwan in 1949, do we? We don't, we don't do that. You know, we just talk about it as like, oh, they immigrated, right? But it was, I think we forget that it was much more than that. Yeah, that's a really good point that you bring up, Yishun. I think that, um, you know, that's something we've talked about in, you know, within our group of, um, you know, not only are we telling stories that aren't well represented or aren't well understood in the American public, but um, we also bring as storytellers our own um, emotional baggage or, you know, our own generational trauma of being, you know, told not only, you know, from the greater society that like, oh, you know, your story is like kind of like out to the side, but from our immediate community that your story is dangerous. And, you know, I wonder, you know, I wonder if you all feel that, you know, I, I feel that even myself when I'm, when I'm writing or when I'm thinking about publishing things that I feel a little bit of like, oh, you know, is this going to get me in trouble? Yeah, definitely. I, years ago, in in the year two thousand, right after uh, Abia was was uh, was running for for president, um, we we went home to to Taiwan to for my parents could, to swing the vote, right, to help vote for an independent Taiwan. Uh, and I wrote my first ever political op-ed for a newspaper that I will not mention here. Um, and I I was so excited, you know. I wrote to my parents. I was like, oh, this is being published in in insert major American magazine here, right? And you know what? They were terrified. They were terrified. They actually, they begged me to pull it from publication. And so literally the night before it went to press, I had to call up the editor and say, uh, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I thought my parents would be really proud of me, right? So in that anecdote, we have, you know, all of the whole like tiger mom, legendary stuff, you know, making her kid pull things, do things, whatever. And then you have the very real fear of my family being like, if you do this, we're going to be persecuted for it. We still have a family back home in Taiwan. Don't do this. You're going to put them in danger. And as an American child, I, what does that mean? That means nothing for me here in America, right? But I had to really expand my, you know, my sense of, of what danger meant in order to be able to fully onboard that. That's such a great point. And actually, interestingly, in the year 2000, in that election year in Taiwan, I also wrote an op-ed, um, my first and only op-ed <laughs> about the Taiwanese election. But um, it reminds me that I think... Uh, Taiwanese in diaspora and Taiwanese in America have a real role here because we actually have the freedom of speech that our parents did not have and that people in Taiwan did not have. And that's why it is so important for us to tell our stories. And it's so also so important for us to preserve Taiwanese heritage and identity in ways that it cannot actually exist in Taiwan in the same way with less freedom and especially during a period of martial law. Um, so I want to move on to our next question, which is, how do you approach using Taiwanese or other languages in your work? For me, um, I sprinkle in some Taiwanese terms um, that my parents use a lot, especially when I'm writing about you know, my childhood, um, and especially when there just isn't the same equivalent in mm -hmm. English. Um, so for instance, you know, if I was 
greedy, like hoarding Halloween candy or something like that, you know, my parents would be like, ah, yao gui, um, which means hungry ghost. Um, you know, I didn't know that it was like a spiritual Buddhist and Taoist term until like way, way later. At the time, I just thought like, that's what you parents call you, your Taiwanese parents call you if you're being, you know, a glutton. Um, and I, you know, even though my mom has at, at this point spent more of her life here than in Taiwan, you know, she still speaks to me in Taiwanese like all the time. So um, when I'm trying to capture her voice, you know, I have to use Taiwanese. Yeah, that's it. Capturing capturing people's voices. And like, I think everybody has mentioned how our families come from such a multilingual background. And, um, you know, I find that needing to, wanting to like sprinkle in certain phrases, whether that phrase is Taiwanese or Mandarin, like that is important. And also the choice of language also reveals something about the context, you know, um, whether this is an interaction with a uh, person outside your immediate family, if this is an interaction that's very um, intimate and personal within your intimate family, or, um, you know, if it's a, you know, public kind of thing and and the fluency that our relatives go back and forth and um, you know switch between these languages is really uh, is really different than than what we experience in America where it's English or English with a little bit of like one other language but but you know like coming from you know really a multi multilingual background is is something I feel is really it's beautiful. I think it's really beautiful and really important to to put down for posterity. I mean, did all of your parents did um, did they speak like this smattering of like mostly Taiwanese, sometimes Mandarin, sometimes Japanese, and then English? My so like a lot of people, I think almost all of us here have have the situation where there is some Japanese, right? Like my father also had a Japanese nickname, you know, that, yep. that he was referred to uh, by, and, and some of his brothers did too. Now, uh, I think this idea of um, smattering actually really only became noticeable to me when my parents started code meshing in English, right? So, I mean, the other day, the other day, what is time? Uh, a couple of years ago, we were we were driving someplace and we were off to a like a picnic, you know. And mom was like, "Why are we carrying all these things?" And then she saw a bunch of people with like picnic baskets, and she goes, "Ah, people ma guan thing, okay?" Which which means, "Oh, everybody else is carrying things too, right?" But it was so like organic and natural the way she said it, you know. So now it's become like hashtag, you know, oh, mom saying something that people ma guan thing, right? Um, <laughs> but it, it it became, I think, most moving to me when I I noticed that you know that that she had adopted English as her own other code meshing tool, right? She can, if she can't reach for something in Taiwanese then she'll reach for it in English, which I find really moving and, and kind of cool, you know, sort of a neat thing. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true that there's this kind of, like our, our parents' generation, like they've been code switching forever. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. and they knew specifically which language for which context, if they were at home with friends, if they were at church, if they were at school or like, you know, in a government office somewhere, it's like they had to switch from like, the sort of popular or popular or, uh, proper Mandarin, you know, so the language of business and the language the government enforced to Taiwanese, which was more vernacular and close and intimate. Um, so I've discovered through writing my memoir that I actually have a lot of language quirks uh, in my writing because, uh, you know, sometimes I'm saying things in Mandarin, sometimes I'm saying things in Taiwanese. Um, and, and I use stuff interchangeably and I just know there's going to be a day where I have to like, you know, meet with my copy editor, hopefully who's going to say, why are you so inconsistent? In some places you call your dad's eldest sister, Duaka, and other places you call her number one aunt. And I'm like, I, I don't know, because my family uses it interchangeably. <laughs> like, I can't just pick one, you know, welcome to my brain, right? Like, yeah. welcome to the this way is they how things yeah. swirl around. Yeah. And, and I, you know, another example is that the, the town that my parents live in that figures a lot in the memoir, um, it's called Sansha. It's a suburb of Taipei. And that's the, the Mandarin name. And so in Taiwanese, it's Samgyap. But when my parents talked about it with me in English, they always said Sansha. So there's a part of me that's like, 
I really want to be loyal to Taiwanese. At the same time, I really want to make sure it sounds like the way my parents spoke. Yeah. And so there's this kind of tension between the two of like, you know, like what choice should I make and what's the right choice? You are scratching at something that is super pertinent for for me. It's always top of mind. I My agenda is to stop making stories from other culture other right it's like we live in america okay we this is like our our demographic is so incredibly diverse and it, our actually our demographic has become so diverse so fast that that we are in what's called a low context culture which is that we have to say everything directly because we're never quite sure which culture somebody else is coming from. Okay, so that that need for a lot of context, right, creates the the type of uh, communication that Americans engage in with each other, right? Um, and if, for me, it's like I'm so tired of seeing foreign words be italicized, right? When when we really are in a situation now to be able to accommodate those words and bring them on board, right? We have so many borrow words in English, okay? Like, I mean, if you look at um, uh, British English, right? They, they regularly say courgette, okay, for, for zucchini, right? Both of those are borrow <laughs> words. If we're not italicizing courgette or zucchini, mm -hmm or the color aubergine, right? Then why the heck are we italicizing tofu? Which by the way, is something that I saw happen in a book that was not published all that long ago. Are you kidding me? Tofu? Tofu. For real. I mean, no, I know, yeah. honestly. So, so I'm gonna stop italicizing all that stuff. And actually in, in my research and in the interviews that I've been doing with um, with, with writers uh, from the, the Desi demographic or from the Mexican demographic or, uh, okay, all Americans, right? Every single one of them has said, we need to stop italicizing because it just otherizes what actually mm -hmm. is an American, you know, word, right? Burrito, if we're not going to italicize that, then we shouldn't be italicizing anything else. Okay, we've already co-opted all those words, so let's just own it. Let's do it, you know? Yeah, putting things in quotes or italicizing and, yeah, yeah are we otherizing Taiwanese all the time? Yeah, I think it's a big discussion. I, th I feel like it's it's come up a lot more recently. I think people are taking more of a stance and kind of, you know, reclaiming space and voice to be able to, you know, use the words that are natural to us and not have to over explain ourselves. Mm. You know, so I mean, that's how we get into situations where you read a menu and it says chai tea or non bread. It's mm -hmm. like, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to be redundant? It's like, come on, people, get with the program. It's like, yeah. these words are not that foreign. You know, we talk about this stuff all the time. We can expect you to do a little bit of work as a reader. So that gets to um, uh, the next question I wanna explore, which is how much do you try to explain about Taiwanese culture versus being left unsaid? Like, what are the kinds of choices you're making about um, how much you accommodate people that don't know us? Ooh. For me, I'll say that, you know, this is probably an intersection of our Taiwanese American identity, um, being a woman, um, being um, somebody raised in the Midwest. I think I'm used to accommodating and explaining a lot. Um, you know, how many times have I answered, you know, where are you from? Where are you really from? I'm sure we all get that, but like, I think I'm gonna guess, and I get it more than you guys do, <laughs> being in Ohio. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes I think, am I explaining something that everybody knows by now? Um, but surprisingly, that doesn't. I mean, like, that, that, that's not always the case. Right. And if you're seeing that people are still like, not sure what tofu is, then, you know, we still have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> but, but Lisa, are you, so are you talking about like, uh, the, the thing about this question that really tripped me up is the difference between culture and history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I, I, I find that folks don't question culture so much, maybe because it's so, it's still considered rude to ask about somebody's culture, right? It's like, you know, if I were to say to them, oh yeah, you know, in my culture, the, the parent always comes first and I would never question them. Most people, I think, would be like, "Yeah, okay, that's your culture. We're gonna we're gonna let that go, right?" But it's it's when you get into the geopolitical history of it and that whole miasma and folks not understanding why it's such a big deal for me to not have to call Taiwan Chinese Taipei in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, that for me, the geopolitics of it is separate from from the culture. Do you see it all as as like being the same? What do you What do you I all think? It. 
I see it as kind of like a flow chart of like, you know, mm -hmm. let me gauge my audience. Like, are they uh, genuinely curious about my culture? Do they want to know about the history of Taiwan? Um, do they just want to, you know, say konnichiwa and assume they've covered me? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just try to figure out like, who is this person? Where are they coming from? What is their intent? And how much energy do I want to invest in explaining my life and my history to them? Yeah. We are all such good code switchers and anticipators. I'm hearing that, you know, like we're, we're, it both reflects where we come from, you know, our experience and, um, and where, you know, where we are in the So in your writing, world. do you all write yeah. like assuming a, a, um, you know, like a starting point of the audience does not know Taiwanese history. So I must fill in the blanks. You know, I, I'm going to say, I've had this come up in workshops a lot, you know, like we're all writers, we we get feedback from other people. And um, for example, you know, I remember sharing uh, a piece of writing with a workshop and, um, and then coming out of the comments, you know, one person in the workshop had completely misunderstood my explanation of, you know, the immigration patterns into Taiwan and, understood it that my family was part of the the wave of immigrants po post 1949 which is like the exact thing that I was you know trying to define myself as separate from so in that case I felt like you know what there is an importance to explaining because explaining is better than not being understood or being misunderstood I think I would love to not have to explain but but I also want to be understood. So, so mm. there's that dilemma, you know, like I would love to just walk into a room and just start talking without having to explain, you know, what my identity is or to clarify anything. But, but at the same time, I'd rather explain than to have the point being lost. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think about this a lot and I would agree with Lisa. I feel like my tendency is to explain and sometimes maybe over explain, and I'm trying to change that. But I think the reason I do it is because um, A, I do a lot of writing for business. Uh, and also I did my MFA more than 10 years ago. And so I think things have evolved a lot since then. Um, but, but I think working within that model, I mean, the reality is, you know, in some ways I'm kind of catering to like a mainstream quote white audience. Uh, and, you know, it's a reality we deal with. And the publishing industry is also, I think, predominantly white. And so I think there's always going to be this kind of space where we have to navigate of like, how much are we willing to do and how much are we willing to explain, you know, versus making them do a little bit of work or be a little bit curious. Um, but I think there's another... For me, I think because I write so specifically and directly about the language barrier and about being an insider, um, my writing is just about trying to understand and un uncover meaning. And so I'm also actually explaining things to myself as much as I'm explaining them to the viewer. You know, yeah. so it's like a catch 22. It's like I, you know, I don't want to do it. And yet I also can't not do it. So. <laughs> But, but I think what you're talking about, though, Grace LP, is, is it, it has sort of like different lenses on it, right? I mean, there there is the aspect of the craft of the essay, which and and in fiction too, you know, to a certain extent, this idea of of noodling your way towards um, an explanation for yourself, and the, the reader gets to come along with that, right? But I think we actually forget too that. Um, there's a certain point at which we can we get to we get to pick our audiences. You know, the reader has a has a key role to play in this, right? Uh, I think it was Toni Morrison who said that uh, her writing doesn't have a lobby to it. Other Black people don't need to be explained to what it's like to be Black, right? Whereas if she was writing for a, a white audience, she might have to you know she might have to explain that. Now the fact that she had a big white audience is that's almost it's icing on the cake for her, right? Um, I was talking to Miriam Gerba who who wrote that. Um, um, great takedown of the American Joan Dirt, Didion right? piece, yeah. and the, mm -hmm. the great Joan Didion piece, right? And I was talking to her about the the amount of code switching that that uh, that is involved in her work, and not even code switching, but just you know flat out Spanish that she uses, where she's relying on the context to convey um, what it is that she means to people who may not speak Spanish. And what she said to me was that her writing is for people who already understand that, or for people who are curious about it. She's going to invite them in, right? 
if they want to come, but she's not about to change her gossip circle for a reader who doesn't care to understand, right? And I think that this is one thing that we have to recognize is that, yes, there is a Taiwanese writing diaspora, but there also is a Taiwanese reading diaspora. Uh, and I think if we if we can onboard that, then that makes our capacity to reach people that much broader, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I completely agree. And I think, you know, it's a question that I ponder a lot, and I'm sure we all do, which is like, who is it that we're really writing for? You know, like, who are our readers? Who is our audience? And so, you know, the more I think about it, the more I think I'm writing for people that are like me, they don't have to be Taiwanese, you know, but maybe it's other immigrants, it's other people that, um, you know, speak other languages or incorporate other cultures or have lived elsewhere in the world. And that's actually a large group of people. Like, I think we we sell ourselves short when we think, oh, it's too narrow and there's not that many people that will be interested. I mean, I would just argue with that. It's it's often other people who are telling us it's too narrow, right? Mm -hmm. Like our stories are universal. Our stories are encompassing human hopes and fears and, you know, relationships. Yeah. So, you know, there it's set in a certain context, but but you know, the the emotional core of the story is is universal and I think we should own that you know, that, you know, we, we have it, you know, a setting, you know, which is our particular setting, but, but our, our, our journeys and our narratives are, are human. Maybe the, the knock on question to that, that is at the root of all this is, um, do we mind explaining? I don't mind it yet. You know, yeah. I haven't gotten tired of it yet. Maybe in part because of what Grace LP was saying earlier, which is that we, we're still trying to parse it out for ourselves, right? You know, yeah. we're still occupying mm -hmm. this third culture, right? So, right. Yeah, I, I, you know, I go back and forth. I think it depends on the context. And, you know, in say, you know, in the course of a book length book, you know, I'm not going to explain in every single scene why something is happening. But, you know, if you read the whole book, you know, the context will become apparent, it you know, it it'll be, be together. Yeah, yeah. You know, but if I were writing a 2000 word essay, you know, to be submitted somewhere, I'd probably put in, you know, some context, assuming that this is the reader's first encounter with me and the subject. And, and you know, so, so I would kind of, I would play it, you know, kind of on a case by case kind of situation thing. Yishan, I like what you said about uh, Miriam's point of view, which is that you're writing for someone who is already interested, you know, and because that is the person that will get the most out of your work versus reaching all the way across to someone who has no curiosity, no background. I mean, the reality is it's it's going to be um, unlikely for them to discover your work. So, you know, let's reward the people that um, that know something about us and want to know more and can empathize and relate and find some common ground. Yeah. It really is like any inclusivity work at the end of the day, right? You know, we're trying to make sure that people have access to all these things, but they have to want that access at the beginning, don't they? Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much. This has been a tremendous panel and wonderful conversation. Um, I encourage all of you um, uh, audience members to, to read our work and we'll share some of those links in the chat when our uh, program goes live. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us, sharing the space for us and um, making space and celebrating Taiwanese American voices. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Thanks so much, Grace. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Grace. Grace.